Hey everybody, thanks for watching. I'm with Dr. Scott Lynn today. Hey doctor. How you doing man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, we're talking about the golf swing and right now we've seen Phil Mickelson has increased his like swing speed which at a time when his swing speed is supposed to be going like this, is it's it actually going like this. Yeah. And then we also we're seeing Tiger Woods and a lot of older golfers continue to uh, really like build up a lot of like awesome speed. And the buzzwords, the like the the three word buzzword phrase that we're hearing so much in instruction uh, that even confuses me a little bit is this thing called ground reaction force. So, what is ground reaction force? Well, I think we have to come back to. I mean, the term comes from Newton's third law, which is action and reaction. Okay. And so, anytime there is a force pushing into one object, that object then pushes back into the other object with the exact same amount of force. Mm -hmm. So if I push into you with five newtons of force, so your body then pushed back into me with five newtons of right, force. Right, right, right. The reason I didn't fall over was because my reaction forces stopped that from happening. Oh, so this is the force and your feet is the reaction well, force. Well, it comes from a lot. Like, yeah. so when I push into you, you push back into me mm -hmm. with the same amount of force that I've pushed into you. If yeah. there's no movement happening, um, but then you have to get into Newton's second law, which is force equals mass times acceleration. So if okay. I push into you and I produce some motion, and the mass and the acceleration you have to think about. But, so it does get a little complicated. Let's not go down that route right okay. now. <laughs> okay. um, but the first thing we, we need to understand is like when we push into the ground, the ground pushes back up into us with an op or equal and opposite direction of how we pushed into mm -hmm. it. And so we've actually gone through, and this is amazing, in like five seconds we've got into Newton's three laws already. Okay. Because um, the first thing, Newton's first law is you need an external uh, force to create motion. I just know about the apple falling on his head. Right, yeah, that yeah, works okay. too. Yeah, yeah, right. I'll give you that, that's gravity. Okay. We, right. we can get into gravity later yeah. if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the external force idea is this ball right here, it's sitting there, it will sit there forever. It will never move. No. Unless what happens to it? Something force. has to act upon it. Something has to act upon it. An yeah. external object outside of that ball has to apply a force to create motion. Mm -hmm. And that's easy when we talk about the ball example, but when we talk about our body, if we want to move our body, in space, we have to push into the ground. We need something external to our body to push off of to create that motion. But so I can you move, move in like a pool. You can move in a pool, yes. Or like if I was in zero G, I would um, just twist around. Kinda. Yes, okay, so, and that's where um, we're gonna use this little disc to show that because that, this takes away. So okay. this is something called the conservation of angular momentum. Okay. And so um, you, you can move your segments. So internal forces come from our muscles. So our muscles create internal forces to move our body segments, but I literally wouldn't be able to do this motion. The ground is feeling that. So there is some, because that's the only thing external to my body that I'm pushing off of, mm -hmm. without something else in my body reacting to keep momentum zero. Okay. And so probably the best demonstration I would say is using this little disc. So the best, I've taught about this ground reaction force stuff for a long time. Yeah. Um, and one of the best videos that, I've sh that I show people all the time, most of you have probably seen, I don't know if you put it on your channel at all, but is the guy on the ice. Yeah, yeah, Instagram classic. Yes. I'll, try to, I'll try to capture it and put it here. Yeah, yeah, might as well. So the guy's on the ice, takes a swing, his feet slip, and you see that his trail foot goes away from the ball. His he hits foot, it fat. He hits it like a foot and a half fat, yeah, uh -huh. and his feet go like this, and he falls, and the ice cracks, and he falls through. And, yeah. Um, and so, and there's another really good video online. There's Chris Como jumping off a diving board at Texas Women's Seen University. Mm -hmm. he, and it, as you see, so what happens when he takes the club away is his lower body goes towards the target, and as he swings through, his lower body goes the opposite way. Yeah, we see that on the ice with slap shots. Exactly. Yeah. And that's exact, that is the conservation of angular momentum. Okay. And so as you're taking the club away, your feet are pushing into the ground, which creates external forces, which allows you to move and create angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you didn't have anything to push into, as your upper body moves to the right and creates right angular momentum, your lower body moves to the left mm -hmm. and creates left angular momentum. So the whole thing's zero. The right. sum of that is zero. Let me ask you this. If you took... Uh, Who's your favorite hockey hockey slap shotist? Slap Who, Who's the guy in the in the in the skill contest? Because I can get this video that did like some crazy speed. The, Ooh, the, that's the, a good the other question. Year, I forget. Yeah. So so if I, if I if I took like a uh, if I took a, a guy from the NHL right yeah. and his speed on the on the ice. Of let let's say his uh, not club head. What do you call it? Blade speed. I don't think they measure, they measure uh, like puck, the puck speed. Right. I don't know if they really. So measure. so let's let's say. I took his puck speed, right? 100 miles an hour, let's say. Yeah, the, the puck is launching at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Would he hit the puck faster if he was on the ground in sneakers and then and the puck was just on ice? Um, well, 
It's different mechanics. Because I can't imagine I'm hitting any faster. No. Well, the thing is, with, with hockey, you, you produce more linear force. Right, because it, it will stop you from this, yeah. this the, the blades, but you, this, will not. Yeah. You can't do that. So, and that's the thing we find in golf. There, there are some golfers that use a lot of that horizontal or that linear that's force, me. and yeah. they don't turn as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we saw you on the plate the other day, right? There mm -hmm. wasn't a whole lot of torque happening, but you had the yeah, horizontal Yeah, tor level horizontal force. Yeah, but, then, yeah. but the torque was not quite yeah. up there. And so, um, and with hockey, you can't do that, right? Because your feet would slip. Okay. And so you produce linear force. And, and obviously, you know, if, if a hockey player stood still and tried to shoot it, they wouldn't shoot okay. it as fast. So okay. you notice when they're doing the, the, long, or the fastest shot competitions, they skate into it. Yeah. So they produce some linear momentum coming uh -huh. into it already. Oh, and it's kind of like a, a, a you spray some ice yeah. and, and then you're, yeah, it's and pretty cool. And then you cool. shoot it. And to me, it's funny. I, I grew up playing ice hockey. Unfortunately, I got Scott, the Canadian, into talking about hockey. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably going to talk about that. It's funny. Yeah. I, I grew up playing ice hockey as a kid and we had wood yeah. sticks. Uh -huh. And so you actually had to hit the puck with the stick to shoot it. And so I think a lot of the older hockey players are now decent golfers. Brett Hall's a really good golfer. Grant Fuhr is a really good golfer. Jamie Sadlowski. Uh, Sadlowski. Well, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say he's older. He's, he's a young guy, but. But, but um, a converted yeah. hockey, hockey to But now golf. the new yeah. hockey sticks are made out of this material that actually to, to shoot it properly, you have to hit it fat. Hit the ice. You hit I've the ice that. first yeah. and the, the stick flexes and then it snaps into the puck and shoots it so hard. Mm -hmm. And so my theory is that the next generation of older guy golfers are going to be awful, or hockey uh, players, because yeah. they're going to be hitting it three feet fat every time. Yeah, yeah, they're used to, <laughs> well, well, maybe they'll be good bunker players. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go. so what can I learn about ground reaction force and whether, uh, uh, from looking at this? Okay, so when we talk about ground reaction force, now we talk about three basic here. types of uh -huh. ground reaction force. The one we talked about the hockey players use quite a bit is the linear one or the horizontal one or the sway. Yeah. And that's the one where you're actually pushing away from the target and it's driving your body mm -hmm. towards the target. Yeah. So I think that's one that the golfers or the, sorry, hockey players would use quite a bit. This one is going to demonstrate how we produce rotational forces. Okay. And so what this shows us is that when we're taking a golf swing, we're actually pushing in opposite directions with each foot. Man, this thing is really as you push into the ground. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's supposed okay. to be. It is yeah. a frictionless disc. Yeah, it really is. And then, perfect. And so this is All right, what so you're- All right, so here, I'm gonna do- You're gonna try one? My, yeah, sure. Let's see what your club head speed is with- uh, Okay, so we got, we got the uh, Foresight Sports quad here. The GC quad, yeah. And a real golf ball, as Rick Shields says. Real golf ball. Okay. Here we go, baby. <laughs> Hey, that contacts. was really athletic. All right, uh, 63 ball speed, 61 club speed. Your your smash factor was not so good. <laughs> yeah, 1.04. <laughs> <Not, not pretty laughs> I got six, 61 miles an hour of, uh, of club, club head speed, speed only. Yeah. And your normal club head speed that, with that would be. That's a, this is a frictionless environment here. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there is still actually you know a little bit of friction there. It's not completely yeah. frictionless. Because like somebody be like, was telling me it's not really so much about the ground force; it's more about the shear force. Well, that uh, ground this force is no a shear force. Oh, it is. Yeah. How so? So ground forces can happen in kind of three directions, right? So they can happen straight down. Mm -hmm. They can happen side to side, like away from the target and towards the target. Yeah. And they can happen forward and backwards, uh -huh. away from and the, the ball. And the torque is just a combination of side to side. Uh, forward and backwards, yeah. Forward, back, yeah, right. forward and backwards, uh -huh. like towards and away mm -hmm. from the ball. Because yeah. what you're doing actually in the downswing is you're actually trying to pull. And everybody's seen somebody in their downswing mm -hmm. have their back foot slip. Yeah. And so that just means mm -hmm. there's not enough friction between your foot, but everybody's downswing, their trail foot pushes away the, yeah. from the target. Yeah, Greg Norman used to hit awesome drives. Yeah, way. yeah, yeah. So what kind of, why, so from a scientific standpoint, mm -hmm. I swing this club 92 miles an hour or something yeah. on my feet. Yeah. That was only 61. Yeah. And it was a lot of effort. Yeah. Why, why was it slower on this thing? Well, because you aren't able to produce those rotational forces. There's no ground reaction forces that can happen here. So the only mm. forces you were using there, because you can still push a little bit side to side using this plate. Right. And you can still push a little bit straight down and produce oh, okay. the vertical force. Yeah. So there's two of them you can still use, but mm. we took away your rotational force there. Because you saw that your lower body went the opposite way. So yeah. you couldn't produce any angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Angular momentum stayed zero. And that lost you 30 miles an hour club head speed. How can we relate using the idea of ground force to build up more speed? Well, this is where it becomes very individualized. Yeah. Um, what we're finding is we, we measure how much people are using the, the side to side force or like we call it kind of the gliding or the horizontal force. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we measured it in a bunch of tour players, and we measure how much they're producing that rotational force or that twisting force. Mm -hmm. Mike Adams calls it a spinner force. And then 
the vertical force, like the launching. So this is one that we've learned a ton about recently because yeah. guys like Justin Thomas and Bubba Watson and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, guys like Lexi Thompson and in uh, Laura the tele Davies. Yeah, in the telecast, I'm always hearing about jumping and, yeah. and always seeing you know Justin Thomas and, and Patrick Reed and other guys yeah. airborne. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's something that I think previously old golf instructors, like I remember when I was growing up, I, I saw golf instructors literally holding kids' feet on the ground. They're like, no, no, you don't jump in golf like that. You keep your feet on the ground. Right. And I think whoever, I mean, Justin Thomas's dad or whoever taught Patrick Reed growing up was smart enough to say, no, like, that's one of your things. Yeah. Keep doing it. And, yeah. and that's ridiculously smart to, to mm -hmm. leave that in there because mm -hmm. Mike Adams always says, uh, you know, Justin Thomas would be selling insurance if his dad held his foot on his ground on okay. the ground when he was a kid because okay. that's one of his major power sources. And he, um, and so, but should, should we actively try to jump in our swing, or is it just that we're moving so fast the jump is a reaction to trying to yeah. shallow out the club or it whatever? It depends. Else? Is is always the answer I give you? I give people on that because it depends yeah. on the human being. What human Let's being is standing it. in front of you? Okay. Um, and so, if you took, um, let's say Gary Woodland. Yeah. Tons of club head speed. And mm -hmm. we've measured him on our plate or have his data on our plate. I didn't measure it. It was, uh, I forget where it was measured from, but um, he has a very small amount of vertical force, but he produces... Even less than tour average. Yeah. He produces a significant amount of, of lateral and a ton of rotational. Okay. And so for his body, the lateral and the rotational works great. And our theory is, and I've never been able to test it because obviously those guys, you know, don't want you screwing around with their swings, but right. our theory is if you added more of Justin Thomas to that body and the way that body is designed and the way it's learned to move, probably wouldn't help. It wouldn't help. It no. probably, and I, I've seen it multiple times where I've been working with amateurs or other mm -hmm. golf teachers on this plate, and we've actually made their jumping force go down or their vertical force, like mm -hmm. we've given them less of it, yeah. and club head speed has gone up yeah, because that wasn't efficient for their body. Okay, because I think in a, a lot of times, I did this test on my channel recently, that uh, we're gonna do another video about, but I did a test on this channel recently where I had heard some cues from a tour pro talk about, um, talk about really j like leaping through Off this area front, here. Yeah. And it made me slow, it did make me slower, kind of, kind of like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, and so all of us. Um, but for I, him, you know, it made him faster. Yeah. So, which, you know, I'm totally. sure is true. And yeah. this is where um, a really good quote. So, um, I don't know if you've done anything with Andrew Rice um, mm -hmm. in uh, Savannah, Georgia. I haven't, but I know. I know. Yeah. So, he runs this thing called the Coaches Camp that happens every December where all these golf coaches come and he brings a panel of experts. So, so I was talking at this Coaches Camp thing. I think George Gankus was sitting there and uh, Cameron McCormick was sitting there and a couple of the ping guys were there. And I was talking about all these tests that I've developed to try to put people in little groups. So Mike Adams has a little right hand grip test. He measures the length of your forearm relative to the length of your mm -hmm. upper arm. He does this little test to see what your rotational pattern is and where you rotate around on your backswing. Okay. And then I do some tests for dominant leg and we're doing these jumping tests now to see how your nervous system works and whether you're a resistor or a releaser. This is stuff we're working on with Ben Shear uh, in New Jersey. So I'm talking about all these tests that I'm putting people mm -hmm. through to figure out to what little group to put them in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Paul Wood is there, who's an engineer for Ping. Okay. And I remember he's sitting there with a beer in his hand. I, I talked to him about it, I think, last year, and I don't think he even remembers saying it. But he sits back in his chair, and he's like, Phew. he's like, I hate working with human beings. They're so messy. Right. right. This little bell went off in my head. I'm like, that's brilliant. They are messy. Yeah. Uh, Paul Wood, a, he's a club engineer. Mm -hmm. And they do a ton of human being testing at Ping. Right. But when they're doing club testing... They use yeah. the ping man. Why? Yeah, they shave a little bit, test it again. Because the yeah. ping man does the same thing every right. time. Yeah. And so, but you can't do that with a human being because the human beings are variable. They do different stuff. Yeah. And so. Um, like, oh, I just had a Red Bull. So this, yeah. this test might be totally or different. Or I didn't yeah, sleep right. so well last night. Right. Or, you know, there's so many different factors that go into human being performance. And that's, I think, why, you know, we'll never master it. Yeah. Human, beings, human beings are messy. Yeah. And so I think your job as a golf teacher or your job as a golfer is to figure out the messiness that is your body mm -hmm. and then try to match that to the golf swing. And if it's something that you don't like, something that your body like can't do, or if you want it to, then, then that becomes a longer process, right? You got to go and work on it in the gym and mm -hmm. do some stuff. But I've seen a lot of golf teachers now that subscribe to kind of Mike Adams theories that can make people better really quickly. So you just take away the things you're trying to do that your body really doesn't do very well and you add more things that, and this is where, um, for my own body, we, we talked about hockey earlier, um, it's really hard to produce rotational forces in hockey, like we talked about here. Right. Um, and so, so in hockey, you gotta kinda calm that down to be able to put a strike on it. Yeah, because yeah. your feet will slip with yeah. these, um, and so you have to be a lot more kinda horizontal or mm -hmm. linear to produce speed in the hockey, 
And that was the first thing I did as a kid. When I was a kid, I, that was the first athletic thing I did was with a stick in my hand. Mm -hmm. And so I think that motor pattern is ingrained in my brain. And so that's one thing that whenever golfers, golf teachers tried to get me more rotational, uh -huh. I would start hitting the ball sideways and my speed would go down. Yep. And I never really understood it until Mike Adams did his little test. Yeah. He's like, no, that's not you. you and them showing you a side-by-side -side as somebody who is really good at rotational stuff. Well, that's what we used to you do, know, right? It's not going to be very no, helpful. When I was yeah. a kid, they'd put me yeah. up and they'd put Tiger Woods up. And I was like, I hit it worse when I tried to it's do like, it. like, what's Woods. your problem? This guy's done. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And the thing yeah. is, and everyone used to say, well, we can't do that because you're not Tiger Woods. And, and I think, um, you know, when I used to talk to golf teachers, I would ask them a question. They'd say, well, it depends. And I like that answer, it depends, right? But then the person who asked the question, the next thing out of their mouth should probably be what? It depends on what? Yeah. And I didn't have that answer. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting closer to that answer now, um, to what it depends on. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I've been working quite a bit, which is a, a theory adapted from Mike Adams' idea of posting. Okay. So when he used to do this test. So go this way just a little bit sure. so that the camera can see you. Perfect. Yeah. He used to do this test where he'd put the club across the top of your thighs and tell you to just turn back, do a backswing. Okay. And he said some people would turn back and kind of rotate around their lead leg. Mm -hmm. Some people would turn back and kind of rotate around their pelvis. Yeah. And other people would turn back and rotate around their trail leg. And so he said there's like a rear post type golfer, there's a center post type golfer, and there's a front post type mm -hmm. golfer. Yeah. And to me, I'd done a lot of work previously on dominant leg. Like what's your strongest or more dominant leg? Yeah. And one of the ways in science that people kind of quantify that is what leg would you kick a ball with? Mm -hmm. Most yeah. people would say right. Yeah. And so in science, they used to say, well, you know, that's the dominant leg is the leg you kick a ball with. And I'm like, I don't know about that. Okay. Human beings are messy, right? I've, I've kicked. Right. I could probably so count I, I would kick a ball with my right leg, but if I was going to dunk a basketball, I'd definitely jump, jump off, off my left, your leg. left. Yeah. And, and maybe that's because I'm using my right hand, though, so I don't know. Right. Yeah. There, it's, it's complicated, right? Yeah. And it also has to do with what you do all the time. Like, mm -hmm. I've played probably two games of soccer in my life. Okay. I don't yeah. have kicked a ball a whole lot. So that motor pattern mm -hmm. probably isn't going to determine my dominant right. athletic pattern because right. I, don't, I don't kick balls. I don't, mm -hmm. That's not something I did, right? Right. <laughs> Whereas the hockey thing is probably something that really determines more yeah, of my yeah. motor pattern pattern because yeah. I did that a ton as a kid that was the athletic thing I did and so dominant leg testing is a lot more complicated than that but I think it's uh, and I don't think it's a um, it's like boxes it's not like your front your center or your rear mm -hmm. I think it's a continuum so maybe you're like little front of center your little rear of center yeah right and so um, this is where I think that's probably the one thing that I would say would be the most useful for somebody using ground reaction forces yeah. to understand kind of what their strongest or more dominant, most dominant leg is. Yeah. Um, Cause that can then help you guide what your forces need to be or what are going to be optimal for you. Yeah. It seems like it'd be a good tool to be like, especially if you had a lot of uh, some time and you'd be like, Hey, we're seeing all your best shots are coming from this kind of pattern. Yeah. So we've tried a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, I was at a uh, talk that Scott did the other night. Just to be like, okay, try this. Bad shot. Forget that. <laughs> Try this. Yeah. Like, oh, good shot. Right. Eh, there might be something to that. Let's, you know. So it's kind of it's kind of help, helping guide you towards. Sure. Yeah. And and the thing is too, um, what I've learned from a lot of my motor learning friends. Um, uh, one specific guy uh, is his name Will Wu. He's at Long Beach State University, um, and he does a lot of work with the track athletes down at the um, Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista, California, mm -hmm. and he says. He'll work with two track athletes and the coaches will identify the same issue in both the track athletes, whatever it is. Okay. There's some mechanical issue. Yeah. Both of them have the same one. So like they're dipping their knee before they do their jump. Whatever it is, right? Yeah. So whatever the mechanical issue is that the biomechanist and the coach has identified and they'll send them to Will and say, okay, we need them to do whatever this is better. These two guys have the same issue. And I'll go to them both and say, okay, his analogy was, uh, I forget, like say quick feet or something like that, right? Yeah. And he says, okay, we got to have quicker feet out of the blocks. And mm -hmm. one guy explodes out of the blocks perfect. The other guy comes out of the blocks slower. That, that fixes his fault and makes him faster. Yes. The, and the other guy. guy doesn't, makes him slower. Mm -hmm. And so then the other guy's like, hey, what's another way we can make quick feet? So maybe it's like, I don't know, I can't remember his, his cues, but like high knees or something like that. Or it could be like, move your hands real fast. Move, yeah, so, sure, like whatever yeah, it is, yeah. right? And yeah. so, and then, but if you gave that one to the first guy, he'd get worse. And so, mm -hmm. so that's where human beings are even more complicated, even yeah. if we have the same fault. Mm -hmm. So say you need more rotation in your swing. I could give you like a force cue, right? Try to get you to push in the ground to create mm -hmm. more. It doesn't work for you, but it works for me. Yeah. And so um, this is where, you know, we really need to have more tools in our toolbox to this alter things. This kind of library of, yeah. of feels. And that's every yeah. time we teach these um, 
ground reaction force stuff, I mean, you have to give people different cues. And what you do is you get better as you start teaching more and more, at coming up with ones that work for more and more people, but they never work for everyone. Okay. And so that's where, you know, an external cue, a kinematic or a motion cue could work better. So sometimes I'll tell people, take this belt loop that you got right here yep. and turn it towards the door back there on your way yeah. through. And so that works better for some people. That works horrible for some people. And so... Yeah, I've done some stuff with, uh, I think it's called Total Motion Trainer, a friend of mine makes. Yeah. And they're the little balls that stick off of certain yeah. areas. Yeah. And he's noticed that if you tell somebody, hey, make your left hip and go this way yeah. with it, he'll, they'll get... They'll, they won't do it nearly as quickly or as well as if he puts the ball there and say, hey, just move this ball back that way. Yeah, and, and that is well supported by science. Yeah. So one of the closest thing to universal truth in motor learning is, um, and motor learning is really interesting uh, to me because it's, it's not something, I mean, I studied a little bit in school, but then I focused on biomechanics. Mm -hmm. But now, now I'm kind of trying to learn as much as I can from my buddies who are motor learning specialists because I think that's the next level is yeah, trying to teach. And what they tell me is, if you're trying to learn a motor skill, it's way different from trying to learn a cognitive skill. Yeah. So if I'm trying to teach you math, yeah. you know, we, we've mm -hmm. done a lot of research on cognitive skills mm -hmm. and how to learn them and teach them. And math is, would that be a little bit more like step-by-step? -step, straightforward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm still, you know, in the infant stages of it. But so one story I always tell people is, um, so, you know, let's say I'm trying to hit a draw in my swing and I'm trying to get an inside out path mm -hmm. with a shut face. So I'm trying to hit a little, or close to the, to the path. Um, and I'm working on that. If, if my buddy Will Wu puts together a, a training plan for me, mm -hmm. a, the training plan or a practice plan will have some shots where I'm gonna try to slice it off the planet. Do the complete opposite of what I'm trying to do because that calibrates your brain. So if your brain knows what it looks like to be over here, yeah. and your brain knows like what it looks like to be over here, it can find the middle. And you'll never ever do that in a, in a cognitive skill, right? I'm not gonna give you a math equation and say, okay, now this time just like fuck it up completely. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're not gonna do that. It's like, a, yeah. like do it completely, no, you're yeah. not gonna do that. But yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a motor skill, it makes sense to do yeah. that. But so there's a ton of research and obviously, you know, human beings are messy and we do research and, you know, we tell you what the average is. So like a lot of times you say, well, this group on average is different from this group because of, um, and so a lot of studies have found that using external cues is better than using an internal cue yeah. to teach a motor task. So that's why yeah. if I tell, move your hip, your hip's part of you, that's an internal cue. Yeah. But if I put a ball here or I talk about your belt loop or whatever, yeah. that seems to work better for most people. Right. Um, and, and with human beings, you know, it's never 100%. Sometimes yeah, the internal and then cue might work for that, some people. I think the Dr. Wolf research that I yeah, saw. Gabby Wolf, yeah. Um, it it kind of depends on the level too. Like. A, uh, a beginner can have some internal cues. Uh, intermediate player can have some, like maybe club cues, and then like an expert can it's have way like the target, the and then and then like the best in the world when they're playing their best in the world can just focus on like okay, this ball's gonna land here and yeah. spin there. Like they're so external. External. So, so like the better you get, it's like you know, and everybody I think has seen that on the golf course yeah. and when they feel in the zone or whatever. Yeah. They're not really thinking about this stuff. You're doing that. The problem is though that if you're playing terrible, you won't, you don't, you can't really flip the switch on yourself just by getting out of your head getting and thinking out there. there. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, yeah. I, and then again, you know, human beings are complicated and there's yeah. psychology to it. But uh, when you talked about that way far away yeah. uh, story, what came to my mind was, uh, have you ever played LACC, Los Angeles Country Club? No. 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 They're a good course. You know, they have two oh, courses, right? The uni courses. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> right. I had a buddy who was a member there. Luckily, I got to play there a couple okay, times. Okay, cool. No, I And the no, story is yeah. you get on, I forget what hole it is, like four or maybe five. I can't remember. It's a long par four. Uh -huh. And it's a blind tee shot on top. Yeah, it's a yeah. blind tee shot on top of the hill. Um, it's got to be 400 something yards. Mm -hmm. And there's a set of three palm trees behind the green, probably another 50 or 60 yards. So these trees got to be five, 600 yards away. Right. And the story that all the members tell when you play there is, and these trees are like 500 yards away and they're like right next to each other. Yeah, from that far away. It's from that far away. One thing, yeah. And uh, so the story is Ben Hogan, the first time he played there, got on the tee with a member. And mm -hmm. the member's like, uh, the line is those palm trees up there. And Ben looks at him and he's like, which one? Right, right. And, and that level, right? They're, right? they're focused on that external cue or that external target. That's yeah. And he was so accurate that like, it made a difference, which is in the zone. Yeah. All right. So we're going to talk to more with Dr. Scott on the channel. What, what would you like people to Google search about you? What, what, what would you like people to uh, 
to check out. I guess there's a list of instructors if you're interested in a swing catalyst, in, in, like a lesson with that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think um, if they contact me, I could find, I don't think we have that online yet. I think that's oh, something okay. we're trying to do, uh, like a TPI model where you can right. go find a TPI certified right. instructor wherever you are. Yeah. Um, but we're starting to get these plates a lot of places now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, if they contact me, I could find somebody in their area that they, could, uh, that yeah. they could try it out with. But um, we're, we're actually refilming a bunch of um, educational content for Swing Catalyst, and cool. it's all gonna be online. Yeah. And so, um, and I think that's the key thing with any kind of technology. So my analogy is always to the launch monitors. Mm -hmm. It was 2009, I believe. I got on a driving range with Sean Foley, and he pulled out this little orange box and put it behind me, right. TrackMan. Yeah. I had a bunch of shots, and these numbers popped up, and he brought his iPad over, and there's like 27 numbers on the, and I'm like, okay, yeah. but. Yeah, right. What the heck right. does it mean, right? But then they started to create algorithms and stuff to work with software to be like, okay. Well, yeah. and then they started to do TrackMan University and they yeah. and the launch monitor companies got into the, the well, first they did the research and then they did the education. And mm -hmm. now I don't know too many people that teach without one of these things now right. because it gives you all this information that really helps you make people better. Why does it make people better? Because we've done the research and now we have the education and, and James Lights with his, uh, with his um, deep plane stuff, mm -hmm. that yeah, stuff that, that really great. made yeah. it you know, mm -hmm. useful. Now we understand these numbers, we understand how ball flight laws are happening, and perfect, that's, uh, okay. that's the good stuff. And so that's kind of where we're going with the ground reaction force. I think it's kind of a buzzword now because people are kind of interested it's in hot it. hot and new, yeah. Right. And the reason they're interested in it is now there's technology to measure it. Yeah. Because in the past, everybody always used to talk about, okay, you want to get like, you know, load up into your right side, get yeah. like 80% of your, pre or your weight, yeah. they used to call it weight. Um, so they've been talking about it forever, mm -hmm. um, but we, can't, we couldn't measure, we couldn't visualize it. Now yeah. we can, and so now we can actually understand how to make it happen. So you guys can send uh, Dr. Scott an email. Click the subscribe button. Thanks for watching, and see you later. Bye.